Support this podcast via our Patreon and get more writerly goodness. Visit patreon.com slash nanocast to join up. Welcome to NaNoWriMo Every Month. My name is J. Daniel Sawyer. I'm the author of some 20 books, 34 short stories, and numerous articles and other things, and I am your guide on this journey to use NaNoWriMo to level up to professional output levels. Welcome to The Questions, Episode 65. Today, J.R. has basically sent me an interview. He wants to know about me. And so he asks a series of questions to get under my skin, and I suppose this is uh, good stuff for establishing credibility and giving you all an idea of who you're talking to. So I'm going to go ahead and dive in here and hope this doesn't go too long and bore the hell out of you. Interview question one. I would love to hear how you transitioned from amateur writer into professional author. The first stories I remember writing were comic book extensions of Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, prequels and sequels, rounding out the universes that I loved most as a five-year-old kid, and that I wanted to hear more stories in, and more stories simply weren't in the offering. So I had magic markers and access to poster board, and so I did up comic books and bound them with string and lost them in a move at some point, which is unfortunate because it would be kind of fun to go back and look. After that, I wrote or attempted to write a Star Wars novel about Han Solo doing some kind of swashbuckling thing. I don't remember much about it besides that. I think I only got about five, 6,000 words into it, but for a seven-year-old, that's a hell of a lot of writing. After that, I read Lord of the Rings all the way through for myself instead of having it read to me. And and the night I finished reading Lord of the Rings, I went to the house of an archaeology professor at the school my father was teaching at. The professor in question was Dr. Patrick Hunt, who's an expert on medieval French and Levant archaeology, if I remember correctly, and I think he's teaching at Stanford now. Pat, if you're listening, this is all your fault. I only knew him as Pat, the guy my dad works with. I had no idea of how utterly, utterly brilliant this fellow is. And in an attempt to get me to shut up and leave the adults alone so they could have fun, he told me that he was writing a fantasy novel and offered to let me read it. Well, I read the first three chapters, which is about what he had written, and I still remember it vividly. I don't know if he ever finished the book. And I got to the end of the reading, and the adults were all still talking about things they wouldn't let me eavesdrop on. So I grabbed a um, pen and paper, and I started sketching out my own fantasy world. And I worked on that book for the next five years. It came in eventually at about 40,000 words, and I wrapped it up when I was 12 or 13 years old. And then tried rewriting it, and rewriting it, and rewriting it until I was about mm, 18, when I finally abandoned it. At that point, I was recognizing that it was pretty much a derivative of Lord of the Rings and every other high fantasy I had ever read, with a bunch of the video game gauntlet thrown in around the edges. At that point, I was in college and I started trying to write short stories, and I was basically always trying to write something in my spare time. My dedication to my craft waxed and waned as I did other things. And then when I was in my early 20s, I had a job where I was uh, managing a courier company on the weekends, which basically involved a single uninterrupted 40-hour shift after two days. So I had a lot of time on my hands when I wasn't sorting boxes and dealing with drivers. And there's only so many movies you can watch. So I started writing a series of short stories that turned into a series of novels that fell apart halfway through the second novel because I was biting off a lot more than I could chew. But, of course, that didn't stop me from sending the first book to every publisher in the universe and accruing an impressive list of rejection notices. Meanwhile, I was writing a lot of short stories, only one of which survives from that time. It's called The Coffee Service. It was about the fourth or fifth short story I ever wrote, and I think it's the only one that still holds up, which is why it's uh, out on the market and also appears in my podcast, Sculpting God. Around that time, I was also writing a lot of nonfiction. I was writing uh, articles, essays, was in talks to write a theology book for a publisher, 
alongside all of that, I got into independent film. And so I wrote a number of scripts, a few of which I produced, a few of which I shopped around and nothing really caught on. Wrote a few radio dramas, produced a couple of them as a way to try out the technology on my home PC, basically. And somewhere along the line, um, towards the end of my ill-fated jaunt in the film industry, I had met a brilliant hacker online. I ran an online filmmaking community called Blender Wars, and I met a number of brilliant hackers, and I was an active member of several other internet forums. And this one kid sort of attached himself to me, and we debated philosophy all the time. And at some point, for some reason, he said, Did you wrote a book once, didn't you? I think I remember you saying that. And I said, Yeah, I did, and it wasn't very good. And he said, I don't care, I want to read it. And so I pulled out the book in the science fiction series where things had fallen apart in the second book, and I sent him the first one, and I said, it's really a piece of crap. It reads like a first novel. He read it, 17-year-old kid at the time, I think, and he sends me back an email saying, you're right, this is crap, but there's some interesting ideas in here, and it might make a good story. You should read it again. And so I said, oh, okay, what the hell, and I took an evening, and I read through it again, and I fell in love with the story I had been trying to tell, but hadn't told very well. So I said, okay, sure, I'll give it another go. And by this time, I had a further 15 short stories under my belt. Several of them have since sold to publications and been reprinted. Some of them I've released on my own, and a few of them live in a drawer where no one will ever see them. But I had acquired over the years of practice a sort of understanding of story, so I sat down and I wrote the book the way it should have been written, and that book was my first podcast novel, Predestination and Other Games of Chance. Meeting Scott Sigler happened about the same time, and it was a major, major milestone on the road for me, because I was interviewing him for a nonfiction podcast I did, and in the course of the conversation it came out that I also wrote fiction, and so as soon as the microphones were off, we broke out the scotch and did a flight because we were waiting for his BART train to come in. And he started preaching the podcasting gospel to me, you know, quoting Cory Doctorow's line about how the greatest enemy of any author is obscurity. It's not piracy. He said, you've got to start podcasting. If you're confident with your work, start podcasting. It won't hurt your chances of selling to New York if you've got a good story, but it will start building your audience, and your audience is your lifeblood. And I thought, now eh, what the hell? I got nothing else to lose. At the time, I had the time because I was running a uh, audio-video services company, and so the work was sporadic. And I was, at that point in time, also writing regularly for Linux Journal, which is something I fell into because I was looking for a way to make money off of all the software I was having to learn to run my business. So I started writing reviews of production software for Linux Journal, and the articles sold, and they sold regularly, and they loved me, which was great, because I made a very decent side stream income off of that for two, three years. And once I started podcasting, I started meeting and socializing with other writers all the time. And I began to see my dream, which I had had since I was a little kid. So the day that I finished Lord of the Rings when I was eight years old, reading it for myself, I had decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell stories like that and, had peop and have people read them. Up till that point, I'd only been doing it for fun. But at that point, I was like, somehow, I want to be a professional writer. And I had spent years haunting the library, reading everything I could on writing, Writer's Digest books, that sort of thing, which didn't really help. And I'd gone to get a literature degree, which completely threw me off fiction for a while, which is why I don't recommend literature degrees. I've got an article about that on my site. Anyway, long story somewhat short. As I started to socialize with writers and began to see it as a viable, if difficult, career path, I got very serious about it and started writing regularly, as every day as I could. I was trying to write 500 words a day. Around that time, I got commissioned to write Down from Ten as a miniseries for a Canadian production company, which folded, so I novelized that. And around the same time, the indie publishing scene opened up, and over the course of about a year, my mindset just switched from I want to do this someday to now is someday, it's now or never, and I'm going to just start doing this and do it until it works. And... That was 2008, 2009, and... That's when I really started to get serious about things, and then when I wrote 
then when I wrote the first of the Clark Lantham mysteries, I got really serious about things, and that's when I started producing multiple books a year. Um, along the way, learning a lot about business, studying copyright law, learning about contracts, the whole thing. Part of that I started back when I was doing independent film, because it's desperately necessary, and that dovetailed really well into all the sorts of stuff you need to learn as a writer. So that was kind of my trajectory. Weird though it be, that's kind of how I got here. Question two. I would also love to hear about you as a younger writer and how you've came to your calling. Well, I guess I just answered that question, so let's move on to question three. What do you use as your muse when you're writing? How do you find your stories slash plots? I don't even know how to answer this. Ideas are so easy once you get used to listening to the idea machinery in your head. All of us have ideas about things all the time, and we just discount them. Once you learn to listen to all those wacky ideas that you would normally throw out, that's when you get the ideas that become your stories. The plot for Predestination grew out of the Sting song Shape of My Heart. It paints a picture of this card player who's playing for different stakes than everyone else around the table, and I thought that was fascinating, and so I wrote a scene based on that song where the card player is actually a bounty hunter trying to ensnare a fugitive card sharp. And I set it in space because I love science fiction, and the whole thing just sort of unspooled from that. When I realized I needed another character, I needed to do the character of the card sharp, Joss Ackland, the um, actor who played the Russian ambassador in Hunt for Red October, there was something about his performance in that movie that suggested a character to me, so I named the character Joss Kyle after Joss Ackland, the actor, and developed the character from there using those brief minutes he was on screen in Hunt for Red October as sort of a mental template of a fast-talking guy who's in over his head and is kind of slimy but has his own sort of integrity. And from there, different elements that were in my life at the time just made them on screen. If you read or listen to my book Down from Ten, almost everything in that book is something that was in my life at the time. I had just learned body casting, so body casting became a major plot point. There were pieces of artwork that were integral to the plot or integral to the atmosphere that were sitting in my living room. I was into my first major flush doing professional fine art photography, and so there's a fine art photographer as a major character in there. I've always been interested in theology and philosophy and politics, and so theology and philosophy and politics make up the meat of the conversations in that story, and all of the characters are arguing positions that I held very passionately at one point or another in my ideological development. And I played all of them straight so that the author's current opinion wouldn't limit the story. And I also mixed them up a bit so that, you know, anyone who agreed with me on one thing was disagreeing with me on something else so that I kept it fresh and didn't wind up just doing a Dan has conversations with himself kind of novel. I based a lot of the people in that novel on people that I knew in real life at the time. Yeah, I just, I had a blast. And, I, I, and I've done that ever since. I just, I pick stuff that's at hand when I get stuck in a story. I'm like, oh, that might be interesting. I'll throw that into the bowl and mix it around and see what I come up with. So that's kind of how I come up with things. The Resurrection Junket came from a offhanded comment made by Juan Enriquez at a TED conversation he was in with Ray Kurzweil that I was watching one day. Um, I think it's still online. It's a fascinating conversation about the implications, the potential futuristic implications of current developing technology. And, you know, my interest in economics and just generally learning anything I can get my hands on continually feeds the idea machine to the point where I don't even know where a lot of the stuff comes from. Question four. What was the hardest story you ever wrote, and why? I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, you know, the first novel I wrote with the intention of it being a novel as an adult, which would have been the completely broken version of Predestination that I talked about a couple of minutes ago, was very, very difficult to write, because I didn't know what I was doing. I find that every couple of years, 
I get a novel that turns into a brain dump. There's something really seriously on my mind that I'm not consciously aware of how much it's weighing me down. And then I finish a book and I look back at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've just poured my heart out into this book. And I didn't even realize I was doing it. And now I'm a little embarrassed and I hope nobody notices. Currently, there are four books in my catalog that are like that. I look back at that, and the audience reads an interesting story, and what I see are embarrassingly raw snapshots of my emotional or, for lack of a better word, spiritual life at the time. I would say probably the one book that had that going on and was also just technically extremely difficult and took me the longest was Free Will, which is the sequel to Predestination. It's the second in that science fiction spy series. It's a long book. It's complicated. It stretched me in more ways than I even like to think about. It stretched me so much that I've been scared of finishing that series ever since, which is why I am now doing the rest of that series all in one year, because the audience has been waiting for it, and I get emails harassing me for it, and I just can't put it off any longer or it's going to die. So I suspect, frankly, that the next book I write is going to be the hardest one because I'm going to be facing down a major, major fear, a boogeyman in my own closet. I suppose the other really difficult one, for technical reasons, the most difficult one I've written is probably The Resurrection Junket because I had to write all of that in the voice of someone who does not speak English as a first or even second language. And that was a very interesting technical challenge because it's hard to get that kind of voice right without making it a weird mocking stereotype of someone who's got trouble with the language. And that goes also into some very difficult emotional and philosophical and ethical territory that is hard enough to explore using fluent command of English and it's even harder to explore while looking at it through the eyes of someone who is from a completely alien culture to my culture of origin, and whose language and thought processes conditioned by those languages are completely different than my own native tongue. Question 5. Are there things or topics that are hard for you to personally write? How do you overcome that, or do you? I suppose there are, um... At the moment, I don't know what they are, but I seem always to run into them. I usually get halfway through a story and go, oh, shit, I've done it again. How do I keep getting myself into these? And I think the real reason that I get myself into those things is because I'm really easily bored. And so if I don't wind up freaking out in the middle of a book because I've got no idea what I've bitten off or how I'm going to cope intellectually or emotionally or as a craftsperson with the box I've put myself into in this book, then I get sort of bored and I wander away and I abandon the project for a while. I've got about six novels on my hard drive that are half-finished, which, granted, is progress because it's down from 12 a couple of years ago. But there are some ideas I take a run at, and there's not enough in them to really stretch me or challenge me, and I get bored and I let them go. And then I come back to them when I find something else that throwing it into the mix will set it on fire for me. Question 6. Is there some topic or activity that you're passionate about that you sneak into every story? I'm thinking of Clive Cussler, who writes himself into a bit role in every one of his books. What has becoming an author taught you about humanity and the world around you that you feel is worth sharing to us plebs? Oh, well, I suppose if I had to pick one thing that seems to show up through my books, it's the nature of responsibility. The notion of responsibility and, I suppose, the notion of responsibility and of adulthood, both of these things are fascinating to me. Because not only do they inflect wildly across cultures, but they have so many troubling implications, and yet they're things that are very dear to my heart. I'm immensely passionate about the Enlightenment Project, and the ability of self-criticism to lift humanity even a little bit out of squalor and delusion. It's worked tremendously well over the last 400 years, 
better in some places than in others, and it has its own problems. But at the core of the Enlightenment project is the notion of self-criticism and the idea that by facing our errors, we can improve. That's a very demanding thing to be interested in, so it tends to show up all the time whether I'm really thinking about it or not. And part of the way that shows up in my fiction is my characters tend to get caught between the reality in which they find themselves and the reality they want to think exists. That core conflict between a person's limited perspective and the way the world exists in its own selfness, whether you want it to or not, is I think probably the most fascinating thing to me about humanity. Humanity's so amazingly capable of self-delusion, and that is such a gift because it allows us to have fantasies and to imagine a better world and to imagine amazing horizons. And it's our greatest curse because it allows us to pretend that the problems that we wade through every day simply don't exist. I'm very interested in the world as it is rather than as I would like it to be, and so I find myself continually caught in that tension, and I think that comes through in almost all of my stories, whether I want it to or not. So, I suppose that's the whole interview. That's uh, six questions, and it didn't come in running too long, so I'll get out of your hair before I completely eat up your entire morning commute. Thanks for the questions, uh, hope you guys enjoyed it, and tomorrow I'll be back with more craft and business and head games related questions for you. I'll see you tomorrow. NaNoWriMo Every Month is written and presented by J. Daniel Sawyer and produced by Artistic Whispers Productions. Visit our website at NaNoWriMoEveryMonth.com and leave a tip in the tip jar or join the Patreon to support this podcast. NaNoWriMo Every Month is copyright 2016 by J. Daniel Sawyer and Artistic Whispers Productions and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivatives license.